How do you learn vocabulary effectively? Well, in this interview with Steve Kaufman, we're going to find out how to do it. Hello, it's Keith from English Speaking Success and the website Keith Speaking Academy, where you can find resources to help you prepare for the IELTS speaking test, free resources and some paid for online courses. Um, my goal is to help you develop your speaking skills so you can face the examiner with confidence and ace the IELTS speaking test. Today, I've got a great interview. Um, I'm joined by, well, this is a recorded interview with Steve Kaufman. He's the co-founder of Link, that's L-I-N-G, capital Q. And this is a platform where you can learn languages with interesting and authentic materials. Very strong focus on vocabulary, um, but it's great. I've used it for learning Chinese and it was really, really useful. Um, I think now Link is mainly run by his son, um, but Steve is is a polyglot. I mean, he he speaks over, or I think at least twenty languages, and is still learning new languages today. It's absolutely amazing. He's an inspiration for all of us. In today's video, we're going to talk about effective ways for learning vocabulary. Steve talks about how the brain really works when it comes to learning vocabulary. We discuss that balance between input and output, so the language coming in and the language going out. Uh, we also discuss active and passive vocabulary and what that means for you. And especially we talk about the four skills, reading, writing, listening and speaking, being connected, right? I mean, it's great. There's lots of interesting ideas, but also some useful tips, um, especially if you are preparing for the IELTS speaking test. I think you'll enjoy this. It was great fun to make the video. Thank you so much, Steve. Let's get straight in there and find out some effective ways for learning vocabulary. So um, here I am today with um, Steve Kaufman. It's great to be back and to see you again, Steve. Long time no see. Same, same here, Keith. Nice to chat with you again. And you too. Just for people who don't maybe don't know you, if there's a first time here to this video or to this channel. Um, now, you are the founder of LingQ, but tell us a bit more about yourself. Co-founder with my son. Okay. okay. So I'm, uh, you know, someone who's very interested in languages, not just English. Uh, although, you know, internationally, English is probably the most studied language. But uh, I learned languages, uh, you know, as a student in France, as a diplomat learning Chinese, and then as a businessman having to do business in different countries, I was always interested in languages. And then really over the last 15, 20 years, I've been particularly interested. I've learned uh, nine, 10 languages, more or less. Uh, Co-founded Link with my son. I have a website, or at least a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve. And it's kind of my third career. Wow. So I'm a And I live in Vancouver. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia. You live in Vancouver, right. Does Link take up most of your time then? Uh I think more time is spent playing golf with my wife. <laughs> uh, Good choice. But uh, yeah, and doing a bunch of other things. But uh, I do spend a fair mostly I spend time learning. Right now I'm working on Persian and Arabic. Wow. Uh, but I do make videos once a week. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's mostly my son who runs Link. I'm not really okay. that intimately involved in, in managing right. Link. No. Okay, fantastic. Well, as a polyglot, you know, you've learned around 20 languages, I think. Um, you right. obviously know a lot about learning vocabulary, which is what the topic we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, yeah. Thinking about how we do that. I mean, so when you're learning a foreign, a foreign <laughs> language, a very general question first. I mean, what do you think are mm -hmm. some effective ways of learning vocabulary? Well, I'm a, a great uh, disciple of Stephen Krashen. Uh, input, you know, getting the language in me. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start from zero, as I did recently with, say, Arabic and Persian, where you also have the issue of the writing system that you have to learn. I mean, I know from experience that 
early on, there's a lot of high frequency vocabulary that's going to come up. Like I choose content that has high frequency vocabulary. And I know that just by dint of listening to it and reading it over and over again, and a lot of sort of, we have these simple stories at link that have a lot of repetition that, that, that the high frequency vocabulary is relatively easy to acquire. You don't have to put any special effort into learning the high frequency vocabulary. The challenge in language learning is because frequency drops off so quickly that, uh, and yet you need the low frequency vocabulary items to understand interesting, meaningful content. Mm -hmm. So then there's a, a very long period of struggle to acquire words that don't show up that often. And, right. but, but basically my approach is that uh, they will eventually stick if I keep exposing myself to enough of the language. I can occasionally review lists of words. I don't do that very often. I certainly don't like doing flashcards. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer to spend my time engaged with interesting content uh, knowing that eventually the words will stick. That's interesting. And do you then also, I mean, you talked about inputs there, getting lots of the language, surrounding yourself in the language. Do you feel it's important to have the output as well to really learn the vocabulary? Uh, I think the output, is, once you have enough vocabulary so that you can have a meaningful conversation, then I think it's important to get into output, to practice output. Mm. Uh, to acquire good input, because if you have a, 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 an interesting conversation, you're interested in what the other person has to say. Therefore, that, that input that you acquire through a conversation is, is high resonance. You're likely to pick up on it. Uh, sometimes uh, if you're talking to a native speaker, they'll pick up on something that you said incorrectly and give you the correct version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think over time, eventually, you have to speak a lot. If you want to speak fluent, if you want to be a fluent speaker of the language, you have to speak an awful lot. Right. Right. Like I'm not talking once or twice a week. I'm talking about <laughs> lots, lots of speaking. But it, at an early stage, it's it depends on circumstances. If you have the opportunity to speak, fine. But if you live somewhere, you know, where the language isn't spoken, I mean, I spend most of my time on input in the initial stages. Right. It's interesting you talk there about input from conversation as well, because I, I think a lot of students think the input is just it's listening to podcasts or it's reading books but you can get input from conversations as well, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think we need to realize that, that input and output are kind of related mm. because all kinds of studies of the brain show that when we are reading, we're actually saying the words to ourselves. This is especially mm. true if we're reading in a foreign language where, you know, obviously you're, if you read in your native language, it's almost instant meaning. You may still be... In terms of what happens in the brain, it's the same parts of the brain as when we speak. But in a foreign language, we kind of sound the words out to ourselves. So we are speaking when we're reading. Uh, also, there's a high degree of anticipation when whether it's, you know, reading or listening. We're almost trying to, the brain is sort of kind of guessing, has certain expectations about what's going to come. So these are active ways of engaging with the language. And similarly, when we speak, we draw from our memory, uh, apparently, according to studies of the brain, we draw from our memory and we sort of try out, first of all, words that we're very comfortable using and then structures that we know work. And, and so there's an element of planning, which is sort of drawing on things we have in memory. So this whole idea of, we shouldn't separate input from output. Being active with the language can be listening, can be reading, can be speaking, can be writing. They're all, uh, you know, related to each other. They're not separate. Yeah. But, but obviously, for the specific skill of speaking well, you have to speak a lot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's often misguided, not misguided, but misleading sometimes when students study in books, the skills are separated, right? They have a lesson on listening, they have a lesson on speaking, mm -hmm. as though in our mm -hmm. language world, they are separated, but they're not. As you say, they are clearly interwoven. Um, pe mm -hmm. People say to read, to, to learn vocabulary, read lots and you learn it but then that's also recycled when you're speaking as well, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but bear in mind though that, um, you know, you're always gonna have a much larger passive vocabulary than active vocabulary. Mm -hmm. It's true even in our native languages. Uh, so I, I think the passive vocabulary is extremely important uh, because it gives us context. It makes it easier for us to anticipate what's coming at us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it makes it easier for us to use what we have. So 
I, I think uh, the idea that you're going to have to use every word, you're going to have to sp you know, use in speaking every word that you have learned is not realistic. You are going to have a much larger passive vocabulary, and that's a good thing. Do, do you think there's, there's different strategies depending on the different level of learner? Because some learners, as you said at the beginning, maybe they're focused on high frequency words. As you get up to intermediate and advanced, do you think students should have different strategies for learning vocabulary? Um, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm very much input based. Mm. Um, I think there are times when you need to focus on certain items of vocabulary. Uh, I, I don't mind looking at lists of words. I don't like doing flashcards because I think they're inefficient. But if you can go down through a list, you can even organ like at link, I can organize the list, sort them by, say, the equivalent of alphabetical order. So then I will see words that have the same prefix. Mm. Uh, which is kind of helpful because you start to see relationships between words that start the same way, that have the same prefix. Uh, there, there are things that you can do uh, in reviewing words that can help, but basically it's a matter of just exposing yourself. You know, I often hear, for example, people who are learning English uh, who say, oh, I, you know, or <laughs> typically, we Chinese, we read well, but we don't speak well. <laughs> so then I say, oh, so how many novels have you read in English? Mm. Not many. No. <laughs> uh, I think that anyone who is serious about becoming a good speaker of a language should read books on paper, away from the computer, away from the online dictionary, in ignoring the words they don't know, and actually get to a point where they find pleasure in reading in the target language. And once you do that, you realize that you have achieved a level of comfort, which just helps everything. Right, right. But you have to get to that level, and that requires, obviously, in, in my case, I think reading digitally, because then you can look words up. Mm -hmm. The idea of looking something up in a dictionary uh, is, is kind of futile because you forget the meaning as soon as you close the dictionary. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah. It's interesting. I, I had a, that, that similar experience with my students in China who said, yes, I'm good at reading, but I can't speak. Um, and I think it comes from that they do well in their reading tests, and that's what they focus on school, right. in school but right. not on speaking. But as you say, when you dig a bit deeper, are they actually reading a lot? Um, maybe not very much. That, that There's a right. big, I, I noticed, I mean, when I look into linked, there, there there's a lot of um, focus on, as you say, input and context. There are novels, there are videos, there are short stories, there's entertainment, there's news. There's lots of stuff you can choose from. Um, how important then do you think it is that students are choosing stuff that they they love and they enjoy. Does it always have to be that way? Uh, well, obviously, initially, that's not the case uh, because we, we have no words. We don't know anything. Mm. We kind of, and that's where I think we use the mini stories because they're designed to sort of repeat the same high frequency verbs and, and conjunctions and structures five times in a story. And there's 60 stories. So that gets you going. That's not mm. tremendously compelling content. But after that, all the research I've done on how the brain learns suggests that relevance is extremely important. Importance, like we learn things that are important to us. Now, in the case of language learning, we are learning about things that are important to us and acquiring the language by doing so. But if the content is important to us, something, say we're in the medical faculty, we need to learn medical terms or or we are interested in literature or history, if, if the subject matter is of interest. And also if, and I like to com combine reading with listening. And so if we have an audiobook and an ebook combined, but then it's important that the voice be pleasant, you know, mm. so the subject matter is interesting to us, mm. the voice is pleasing. All of these things influence uh, the extent to which we're gonna stay focused and that we're gonna acquire the words and expressions, you know, phrases that are in that content. So yeah, choosing stuff of interest is very important. That's really interesting. You talk about stuff of interest, but also quality, like the nice graphics or the nice voice that comes across. It's interesting. I mean, for, yeah. for my my students who are studying IELTS, for a lot of them, that mm -hmm. there's sometimes a balance because there are things, there are topics that they enjoy that they will study, but they're aware in order to to do the test and to be good enough to go to university, for example, they have to be able to be able to converse across a wide range of topics that maybe they're not interested in. I mean, they're probably maybe right. not interested in climate change, 
but they need to know about that topic. Um, right. Is there, are there any tips or, or not? I hate this word, tips and tricks, and I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that because it's a horrible yeah. word. But any advice you would give about that where they're, they need to study a certain topic? Well, yeah. So, I mean, people who are studying English are in the fortunate position that uh, English has more content available online than just about any other language. Sure. And this can be in television programs, it can be articles, it can be podcasts. And uh, if you're going to do something on climate change, I mean, there is no shortage of audio and text material on climate change. There is undoubtedly, I mean, if you were to go to any podcast service and pump in there, you know, global warming, you'll get all kinds of podcasts. Yeah. And so if you can find one or two people who talk about this subject, uh, whose voices are pleasing, uh, that's going to be, I think, more effective than certainly than studying a list of words, mm. because trying to learn words out of context is very difficult. That's just not how the brain works. The, the brain needs things to connect with other things. Uh, but if you can, I think it's just a matter of searching for people, pod, particularly podcasters. We now have a function at Link where uh, if I can grab an MP3 file, I import, I drag and drop the MP3 file into the import section, and we use Whisper A, uh, artif AI, artificial mm. intelligence, to create the transcript. And the transcript is then timestamped, so that if I then review this in what we call sentence view, so it's one sentence at a time, mm. I then have the audio timestamped for that sentence. I can look up the individual words. Mm. Uh, there's even a function there where I can, you know, the, the sentence gets scrambled and I have to re, you know, put it back together again. There's all kinds of ways that I can sort of pay a little more attention to the uh, vocabulary there that's important to me. Um, that's nice. So, you know, I think the key is, yeah, so you got to go find stuff. Yeah. You know, any language learner, you know, has to have some initiative. <laughs> if you're relying on the teacher to give you all the content that you're going to use, you, you're probably not going to get there. You really have to have that initiative to search out things. And, you know, I was going to comment, too, on the subject of the voice. Yeah. One of the great failings of language textbooks, particularly for the beginner and low intermediate stage, is that the narrators, their voices are so boring. Yes. Uh, and... And, and, you know, someone pointed out that, I think it was a book I read by the German neuroscience scientist Manfred Spitzer, if a father or a mother reads to their child on a subject of interest to the person reading it, wow. the baby will learn more vocabulary from that than if the parent is bored reading, you know, a Little Red Riding Hood. So the, the uh, voice, the emotion that of the voice is extremely important. It's surprising, but, but that, that is the That case. is really, yes, that's fascinating. And it, it, it doesn't surprise me the bit about the mother and the father. Do you know when I was learning in mm -hmm. Spanish many, many years ago, I used to listen to cassettes right. of, of South Americans speaking Spanish, although I was mm -hmm. based in Spain. But I also used to make record my own voice, repeating the sentences and listen back to that. And I don't know if it was something mm -hmm. around familiarity of the voice, but that helped me a huge amount. Sure. Maybe it's self-love. I can imagine it would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, well, it's a form of uh, output, and also you can see your gaps. If yes. When I make a video in another language, and if I look at it later on, I see my mistakes. Right. And uh, that's. I think it would be an interesting exercise for people to record videos of themselves just talking about anything in their target language, they will see their mistakes. We see most of our mistakes ourselves. We know where our problems are. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, and self-correction is much more powerful than having a teacher tell you, boy, that's mm -hmm. wrong, <laughs> say it right. Mm. Right. Interesting. I've got a, well, a couple of final questions. Um, one of them is a question sure. students often ask me, um, and they often say that, it kind of harks back to what you were saying about when you're reading, you've got this voice going in your head. And students say that I've learned vocabulary for a topic, for, for some questions, for an interview. And when I say it in my head, it all sounds perfect. But when I come to speak, mm -hmm. um, I just can't find the words. The words are not coming out. It seems like the words just vanish from my head. Um, the vocabulary has gone. What's going on and what can they do? Um, you know, obviously, it's it's a matter of pressure. First of all, you aren't going to remember everything every time. That's just a given. 
if if you are the more comfortable you are in the, uh, in the language the better that's why i say you have to speak a lot because you'll put yourself in that situation you fall flat on your face the first time the second time the third time but by the fourth and fifth time you're more comfortable and so you, you feel less pressure i mean you yourself know that if if you have to try to remember something somebody walk in the room i know his or her name what is his or name? can't remember yeah. If you leave it for a while, it'll come back. So if you put yourself in a situation of pressure, it's more difficult. And that's why you need to put yourself in those situations more often. So trying to remember, remembering stuff when you, there's no pressure doesn't mean you'll be able to perform under pressure. So you just have to put yourself in that situation as many, many, as many times as possible. The other thing too is the more often you're in that situation, the better you can, again, anticipate what the question is going to be. You know, a lot of what we do, a lot of what the brain does is make us, you know, able to deal with a world of, of all kinds of things that are coming at us. And in many cases, we kind of anticipate what's going to happen. And when you go into your meeting with an employer, uh, someone who's going to test you, you have that, you don't have that same comfort that you can anticipate what's going to come at you. So the only solution is to just to do it as much as possible and mm -hmm. to continue your listening and reading so that you're bombarding your brain with with the language so that uh, you you have more uh, resources when you face this situation right good so that continual cycle of learning and input as well as yeah pushing the comfort and zone. practice practice yeah. pushing your comfort zone. yeah yeah nice very quick final question for you how do you see the future with the arrival of ai technology on english language learning well, or language learning in general. Yes. Obviously, you know, chat GPT, if I say give me, you know, 15 sentences using the, uh, I don't remember all the names of tenses <laughs> in English because it never mattered to me, but the progressive past or whatever they have yeah. there. If you say give me 10 examples of this, AI will spit them out right away. So you will get 10 examples or 20 examples of whatever you want, which can be quite useful for reinforcing you know, your familiarity with certain structures. Uh, I see now you can ask uh, questions of ChatGPT. Uh, you can even speak to ChatGPT, yep. have a conversation with ChatGPT. But I, I think, you know, language is about communicating with things that are real. Mm -hmm. uh, when we listen and read, it should be subjects that are important to us, that are authentic. Uh, a big problem with so many language textbooks is that all the sort of role playing mm -hmm. and they're at the train station or at the hotel lobby and it's not real. And so, you know, would I, because the biggest constraint we have as language learners is time. Yeah. And so would I rather spend my time talking to GPT, GPT in a sort of artificial conversation or would I spend 10, $20 an hour or whatever it might be for an online tutor and have an actual genuine conversation? Mm. And I'm not convinced I think there's an element of fad in, in this sort of chat GPT stuff. We've got to, each person has to decide for themselves what use they want to make of it. But yeah, you can speak, spit out 10 examples of a certain structure in the language, ser and estar in Spanish, for example. But is that a better use of your time than listening to an interesting, uh, you know, news item or story nice. in Spanish <laughs> that you can also read? So those are the decisions we're all going to have to make. But uh, yeah, it's going to influence it. I, I think it's a little early to say exactly how. But I think authentic interaction between speakers, between teachers and students, between students themselves, that's not going to go away. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a great message. Authentic communication. Maybe things like ChatGPT are tools that can help us on the way, a bit like reference tools like mm -hmm. dictionaries and, and so forth. But yeah, I, I very yep. much agree. Um, real meaningful communication is, is where you're going to develop your language and use your language in the future. Great. Yep. Lovely. Um, Steve, it's been great chatting to you. Um, for people who want to know it. more about you, where, where can they find you? Well, I have a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve, where I once a week put out a video. Uh, I understand that I have Instagram and TikTok, but other people <laughs> I understand. put those out. I have you no idea what's it. happening there. It might still be Lingo Steve. Okay. Uh, and then Link, of course, lingq.com uh, would welcome people to come and visit me there. Brilliant. I'll leave links down in the video description. It's been a pleasure as always, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Bye. Take care.
Great, I hope that you enjoyed that and found it useful. If you want to learn a new language or just improve your English, go and check out Link. Um, it's L-I-N-G-Q dot com um, and go and see the platform and you can start learning the language and the vocabulary with interesting and authentic materials. A big thank you to Steve. It was a great interview. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to all of you for watching as well. I hope this helps you. Do remember, please like the video if you liked it. And also do subscribe, turn on notifications to find out about new upcoming videos. That's it for today. Take care and I'll see you in the next video coming around the corner. All the best now. Bye bye.